Um, so, hello, good morning, hi everyone, good afternoon or good night for those who are not in Latin America. Welcome to the panel 12 of the International Conference on Policy Diffusion and Development Cooperation. I'm Camila Saraiva from the Federal University of ABC region in Brazil, and we'll be moderating this panel. This panel was proposed with the intention to explore how geographies of power relates to urban policy mobilities by examining how micro and micro, micro and micro dynamics of policy transfer are interconnected with urbanization processes and the making of cities. Considering that power issues, alliances, conflicts, and contestations are still overlooked in policy transfer literature, more authentic and to positive and successful examples of diffusion. So now before explaining the panel's dynamic, I would like to make some acknowledgements. First of all, I would like to thank Osmani, Miwa, and all the organizing committee for this opportunity and their tremendous effort of realizing this conference on the virtual mode. I also would like to thank and acknowledge that this panel was conceived with uh, Dr. Roberto Sakai, who unfortunately, for personal reasons, had to, to left the panel organization as well as uh, her participation on it. And finally, I would like uh, to very much thank Dr. Gabriel Silvestri and Dr. Guillermo Hahamovic for accepting to be our discussants here. Dr. Gabriel Silvestri is lecturer at the Department of Urban Studies and Planning at the University of Sheffield, UK. And Dr. Guillermo Hahamovic is adjunct researcher at the National Council for Scientific and Technical Research based at the Institute of Latin America and Caribbean Studies at the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina. Both have been researching and publishing individually and together on the circulation of urban ideas and urban policy mobilities. So I hope you, we are going to have a great discussion. And regarding the panel session dynamic, each panelist will have around 10 to 15 minutes to present following the conference program order. And because we are, we were going to have four presentations today and up to two hours, discussions organized themselves to discuss each work at the end of all the presentations and suggest, suggesting general crossing comments and questions about them. I think we can keep it like that. So after each presentation, I'll just pass the floor to the next author. And after discussing comments, I will ask to each panelist um, to address comments, questions, and critiques following the same order of uh, the presentations. Um, then I will read the eventual questions that those who are watching us live on uh, YouTube eventually drop through the chat. So please do it. <laughs> uh, but also panelists can uh, pose questions one to another. Uh, Ana Mafalda Rodriguez, uh, who was going to present her work with uh, Giovanni Allegretti, could not join us today. She got the COVID-19 last month and is still recovering from it. So we do hope you get well soon, Ana. And uh, to have further opportunity debate on urban policy transfer with you. Uh, so, without further ado, let's pass to the presentations. Following the conference program order, I am the first to present, then Constanza and then Juliette Marie. So, Miwa, could you please put the presentation? Okay, so my presentation is entitled Islam Upgrading Geopolitics and Technocracy, Positioning Sao Paulo Within Global Urban Development Aid. As the 
change in the title indicates this paper is still in progress, is a draft version, very draft version, and it's an attempt to push further uh, one part of my PhD thesis. So I'm very grateful of having your comments and critics on it. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the paper departs from the research gap that even in the face of an existing global infrastru infrastructure to propagate Islam upgrading, only a few studs have gone far beyond Damascus case to examine it as a globalized urban policy model. However, when they do so, usually the links with local agencies are not the object of further attention. For those who are not familiar with Islam upgrading, following Sitzelein's definition, it can be understood as a process through which informal areas are gradually improved, formalized and incorporated into the city itself. It thus includes not only the provision of basic services, uh, like streets, footpaths, drainage, clean water sanitation, but also land tenure, security and access to education and health facilities. Next one, please. The general aim of this paper is to analyze the entanglements between successive transformations in multilateral organizations agenda. And by multilateral organizations, I mean the World Bank and the UN APTA mostly. Um, the transformations in, in, in their agenda for urban development and the trajectory of Islam upgrading policy in Sao Paulo. The paper is structured in three parts. In the first part, I analyze the evolving approaches of multilateral organizations for urban development and the institutionalization of a global urban policy paradigm, which amalgamates Islam upgrading with financial mechanisms for individual home ownership and strategic planning. Then in the second part, I analyze how it has been specially embodied by the CITES Alliance, the multi-donor partnership established, created by the UN HAPTA and the World Bank in 1999. And, uh, the, and I analyze the marginal but important role played by Islam upgrading in this global urban policy paradigm. Then I move further to situate and understand the singular trajectory of Sao Paulo Islam upgrading policy within this global circuit. In other words, I analyze how Islam upgrading policy were impacted while also contributed to shape a policy model, a policy framework with mobility. In general, uh, what the paper demonstrates is how Islam prograding technocracy of scientific legitimacy and supposed neutrality was confirmed over more than two decades of mutually rewarding connections built between multilateral organizations and technocrats, politicians, consultants, and academics from Sao Paulo. In terms of conceptual framework, next slide, please. The paper draws on the concept of a global policy paradigm considering urban development as a policy model that extrapolates the borders of one state that being constructed through multiple sites and scales are legitimated through expert knowledge and disseminated globally. The proposal of dissecting the formation of global policy paradigms is here intertwined with the discussions on the relational and territorial dimensions of urban policy making brought by the policy mobility literature. In that sense, not only multilateral organizations and transnational networks are scrutinized, but also seat specific territorialized agents involved in policy circulation, performing as local technocrats. Next slide, please. The methodology consisted of analyzing the agendas of the UN APTAT and the World Bank for Urban Development from the 7th until the creation of the CITES Alliance and thereafter of CITES Alliance agenda. Through selected bi bibliography, this was done through selected bibliography and documents produced by these organizations, 
And despite the plurality of points of view and approaches within them, given their size and their complexity, I intended to emphasize the converging set of ideas or certain consensuses about urban development at different periods. And also, uh, in the second part, the historical retrieval of Islam progressing policy trajectory in Sao Paulo, with particular emphasis to the engagement of multilateral agencies with this municipality and the subsequent circulation of its technical experts around conferences, workshops, technical groups, campaigns promoted by these organizations. Um, this was done drawing extensively on government reports and different types of media materials and interviews. It's worth to clarify that the methodological choice of presenting the analysis of the evolving approach of multilateral agencies for urban development before the Sao Paulo experience of slum upgrading was taken with the aim to position the singularity of these trajectories of this, this trajectory amid flows and global political economic conjunctures that cross and extrapolate this single case. It does not reflect any understanding of the local as over the term the by the global. Instead, it reflects the search to elucidate forms of power at work as urban policies travel through different territories, forms of power thus constituted by the interacting of multilateral organizations and subnational units. Therefore, the construction, the construction of global policy paradigm is seen as a negotiated process, mutually constituted by different actors engaged in transnational, national, and local spheres of action. Uh, next slide, please. And this table presents the different phases, summarizes the different phases of the long commitment of multilateral organizations and Sao Paulo. And also the, uh, the, the general rationale or framework that uh, informed these different phases. So I tried to cross this with uh, the Brazilian federal programs and municipal programs. And uh, I, I, this shows a commitment that apparently has been reciprocally beneficial for multilateral organizations to enrich their global urban agenda and for the domestic institutions to technically validate their projects and politically enhance their legitimacy and power in local jurisdictions. Uh, this is what I, uh, what I, what I, think after analyzing this, this table that I will not get into details, but I will highlight some of what is behind this table um, in, in some of my preliminary conclusions that I present now. Next slide, please. So, Throughout the last five decades, a global policy paradigm for seats has been consolidated, centered on housing financialization and speculative markets expansion. Slum upgrading has been sustained within this paradigm, as ultimately it can enable the entrance of slums in the formal real estate market. In correspondence to this rationale, a, te a technocracy around Islam upgrading was constructed by multilateral organizations and has been strongly disseminated. In this process of building a Islam upgrading technocracy, some local experiences stood out, such as the one developed in the city of Sao Paulo. Until the 80s in Sao Paulo and Brazil at large, the eradication of favelas was the most common practice. The first loan for the development of infrastructure projects from the World Bank to the Brazilian federal government came in 79. The decision of upgrading instead of removing favelas, however, was by then increasingly a matter of major social claims among civic organizations, social movements and academics in the context of the return of democracy. In Sao Paulo, as had occurred in some municipalities before it, 
The first citywide land upgrading program was implemented with municipal resources. The first agreement involving the municipality and the World Bank was settled in 92, when a technical and conceptual framework to upgrade the favelas was thus already being deployed. Multilateral organizations then boosted it, introducing into the thriving policies at that time its techniques, rationality, and criteria. Throughout the 90s in Brazil, and Sao Paulo included, it was through programs financed, financed by multilateral organizations that favela upgrading experience gained scale and was consolidated. However, it can be said that when these multilateral organizations arrived, local policies were already walking on their own legs. Therefore, the assemblage, next slide, please, of Islam upgrading technocracy has not been top-down driven, but a negotiated process between global and local actors. The connection of Sao Paulo municipality and the Brazilian federal government with the CITES Alliance in the 2000s must be understood within this broader and long relationship established by the federal government and different local authorities with multilateral organizations. On the one hand, Sao Paulo served as a kind of a laboratory for what they could build in other localities and scales. On the other hand, these global agencies gave legitimacy and visibility to the municipality efforts in improving the living conditions of the poor. For such a win-win relationship, the role of particular experts from both sides were fundamental. In turn, they used this relationship to technically validate their work and politically legitimize their positions within their local jurisdictions. It may seem paradoxical that uh, once ideas of the just city and the right to the city that had motivated many Islam upgrading projects in Brazil at the beginning found reverberation and were amalgamated with a bank-based model a bank model based on urban productivity. Local knowledge and practice, however, when framed as best practice, are uprooted from their contexts and singularities. Thus, multilateral organizations can use the local agents to produce new knowledge, which subsequently can be used in a way that fits their ideology, conception of the city and the urban. After a long engagement with multilateral organizations, what I observed is that Sao Paulo was somehow habilitated to disseminate its own model of favela upgrading. In that way, not only transnational municipal networks, NGOs, or think tanks would help the World Bank to put forward his wholesale approach of disseminating an urban agenda, but the own materiality of individual cities carefully selected. And I'll stop here. <laughs> Thank you for your attention. And as we have previously agreed, I'll pass the floor to Constanza Uriksen from Universidad de Chile uh, with her presentation, Smart Seats and Electromobility in Chile genealogy, circulation, and implications for new forms of urban planning and governance. Constanza, the floor is um, yours. Thank you, Camila. Good morning. Uh, I don't know if you can see the, uh, the screen. Can you see the screen? Um, I don't hear very well. check if you're if you're there because I don't I can I cannot listen you yes okay so good morning uh, my name is Constanza Ulrichsen I'm a, PhD, I'm a postdoctoral research fellow at the uh, Faculty of Architecture and Urbanism at the University of Chile. Um, the research that I'm going to present right now is related to the circulation of the smart cities concept and electromobility strategy in Chile. 
and I am trying to see the implications for new forms of urban planning and governance. This uh, is a research funded by the uh, Fondesit Fund, National Fund, and I'm, I'm a, member, a member of the uh, Nucleo Milenio Mobilidades y Territorios, uh, which, which is a, a research uh, center in, in Chile. Uh, what I'm going to present today is um, why the topic is relevant in Chile right now, what is the research question and hypothesis, how am I studying it with the approaches and methodology, uh, some prelimin preliminary results and some final thoughts. Um, why the topic is relevant in Chile, uh, one is because uh, uh, there is a need to understand a notion that is ambiguous, smart cities, uh, also because of the current relevance that it has in urban development, not only in Chilean cities, but throughout the world, the world, and because of its neoliberal urban logic and the strong role that private companies occupy in decision making regarding urban problems and of public nature. Electromobility, in that sense, uh, my object of study is it's been uh, the, the, the star dimension of the Chilean smart cities model uh, since uh, a couple of years now. Uh, what I'm studying is um, the, the research question that I, that I started with, uh, is how do the ideas and smart cities discourses emerge and circulate in Chile, in particular, electromobility's approach? And what implications do this process have in new forms of urban planning and governance? Um, the hypothesis that I have is that a smart cities concept represents a slogan or market strategy that seeks to create the need to incorporate technology to solve urban problems, acting from a logic of replicability of the model, which impairs the understanding of local needs, capacities and expectations. Electromobility would also be a urban utopia, zero emissions, an economic development engine, and one more business. It is questioned that it is a public policy for the improvement of the quality of life of citizens. Um, the approaches and the methodology that I'm using um, comes from the urban uh, policy mobility approach. Um, I uh, develop a multi-situated ethnography of smart cities events between November 2018 and October 2019, and I recently did a social media analysis of the social network Twitter. Um, um, I studied the smart cities concept circulation in three periods of time, uh, pre-social outbreak or normal times uh, between March uh, until October 18th, 19, uh, 2019 social outbreak between the uh, the event, the October 18, 2019, and mid-March 2020, and of course, the, the recent uh, period COVID-19, since mid-March in Chile, uh, in um, September 2020. Uh, the combination and complementation of big data and qualitative small data uh, would allow achieving greater depth and meaning. That's a kind of experimentation that I'm, um, I'm uh, recently starting to use these two kinds, very different kinds of methodology to study the circulation of the smart city concept and electromobility strategy. Some preliminary results uh, first, uh, the face-to-face -face smart cities event during normal times. I studied, I, I attended uh, many more events, but I am going to select 10 events for this analysis. These are the names of the events. Uh, uh, some of them are Smart Cities to Smart Citizens, Construction of Digital Agenda 2028, Future City Innovation, uh, uh, Creating a Future in City Mobility. Let's think about the Chile of the future. Uh, there are other related, related to smart mobility, um, um, like um, the talks by WE, um, the, the power of the city, Electromobility Fair, etc. So I studied these 10 events for this occasion. Uh, here we have some pictures of them. Um, in general, I studied uh, several variables of the circulation of the, the concept. One of them uh, were where the events took place 
took place. And most of them uh, are in Santiago, were in Santiago, in high com, uh, con uh, area. Um, also about the who, who participated. Most of the actors involved in the events analyzed come from private company, companies linked to the field of technology, specifically information, technology and services, ride sourcing and other transport companies. Multinational corporations also have an important presence such as Deloitte, ABB, Engie, Alstom, Transdev, Uber and Albe Marle, uh, the, lithium the, the American lithium company in Chile. Uh, the national ecosystem is composed by actors who appear more frequently, either as a, the event organizers, sponsor or speakers from the private sector, from uh, trade associations, from foundations like País Digital, um, and from the public sectors, uh, the most important being Corfo, uh, the corporation for the production for the promotion of production and economic development and also different ministry of transport representatives um, and people from academia the universities more present are uh, are the ones that we have here udd uh, the the uh, pontificia universia catolica with pablo alarth um, leadership very present and also, um, there are two actors that, although belong to the private and public sectors, one, one each um, correspondingly, they serve a special treatment as public-private enterprises. First, Do Smart City, a private company which specializes in information technology and services, and it is financed mainly by the intendancy uh, of the metropolitan region and Corfo through País Digital Foundation and also C Santiago Smart City, a public-private initiative promoted by Corfo, metropolitan region, um, and País Digital. Uh, the event structure tells a lot about how the concept circulates, usually an expo, um, uh, followed by a reception and a networking and opening ceremonies, forums, roundtables, workshops and presentations with coffee breaks, etc. So this structure is not new. The events follow uh, the model of fair trades, whether industrial or professional. Um, in terms of how the concepts circulate, circulates is also related to a specific way the roundtables are composed. Most of the time they are integrated by representatives from the private sphere, the public sphere, the academy, a foundation or NGO, and a moderator from, uh, from one of the, um, the sponsor institutions or a well-known journalist specializing in innovation, technology, etc. This composition tells a lot about the expected governance the organizers want to create around the topic private-public partnerships that allow that will allow future opportunities for businesses and matchmaking of public needs and private products and services. In terms of uh, regarding what circulates, the information collected reveals the key ideas, strategies or policies and technologies related to smart cities that move uh, during these, day, these events. Overall, uh, the narrative that repeats itself and ag again and again in every event is composed of two fundamental parts, the needs and the problems of the cities of the future, which will be increasingly dense, complex and unmanageable. On the other side, the solutions offered by innovation and technology and the strategic links between private and public sectors that, will, that would allow better quality of life and more efficient and sustainable cities. Um, in terms of the strategies or policies tackled during the events, two of them stand out, innovation and electromobility. Both are fundamental columns of the smart cities model in Chile. Um, within the Chilean so social smart cities model, electromobility has become the protagonist or star dimension in each event and initiative. 
the government launched the national electromobility strategy the year 2017 and after that it has intensively included the topic in the public agenda uh, in recent in recent years electromobility has been installed as a predominant approach in planning and sustainable future transport hegemonizing the response to global warming from mobility um, in Chile, in mid-2020, it was announced that the electric bus fleet was the largest in Latin America and the second in the world after China, with 676 electric buses in Santiago. There are uh, declared benefits and important gaps around these declared benefits that, that could, we could talk about later, but let me move on uh, because I don't have much more time. Uh, to the Twitter analysis of the smart cities concept in Chile. Uh, this is the, the other part of the methodology that I'm using. Here, the results show tweets on the topic of smart cities according to the data capture and selecting process. Um, as table three shows, the Twitter activity by individuals is much higher than the actors who were categorized as academia, private sector, public institutions, foundations, and the international agencies. Figure four shows how the number of tweets increased during the social outbreak uh, period. However, that doesn't mean people started talking more about smart cities, but account users related to smart cities increased their activity on Twitter between October and December 2019, right after the social outbreak. Um, on the other hand, uh, Table 4 displays uh, nine word clouds of terms most related to smart cities concept, smart city strategies, and technologies for the three periods studied. If we observe this cloud uh, in relation to the strategies, the second road, um, for the same period, the, the first period is the blue one, normal, the first column, a clear discourse on smart cities uh, is perceived in which smart cities was linked to innovation, science, technology, and the minister Andres Kova, Ministry of Science and Technology, probably due to his role in the COP25 that was going to take place in Chile at the end of 19, uh, 2019. Another important observation about this first period is that for the technologies work crowd, the, the third uh, role, people who talk about smart cities on Twitter refer to companies that went bankrupt and the layoff that occurred in that period. From here, we can begin to perceive how smart cities discourse is more associated with a productive and business activity than with the city and urban planning. The companies that appear actually in that cloud are Foodware, Albano, Food, Yansa and Danone, Pasta, Suazo, Container Industry, Maersk. Uh, the, construction, the, the construction company Ciel is the only one that comes closest to, to, to urban issues. Uh, the work clouds for the social outbreak period show the, 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 show, the, 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 the green one, the column in the middle, uh, show new terms more frequently used by the user accounts who talk about smart city, big data, social and personas, uh, people. Uh, the use of the term innovation decreases. Uh, and if we put this information together with the new terms in the cloud strategies, the second road, referring to feelings such as anger, grief, and others such as dignity, we perceive how the national contingency goes beyond the smart city issue. The same happens with the cloud technologies in the third uh, road, uh, and the similar situation, of course, during the period COVID-19 in, uh, in the last column uh, in um, color orange. So let me, uh, let's take a look at the first um, visualization of the networks analysis. Um, this and um, the next two figures that I'm going to, to show, they are, these are the, the last two that I'm going to show right now, show the relationship between users and the frequency of use of the terms within the topics of strategies and technologies. Um, the weight 
of the axis corresponds to the number of times a user uses each concept. And the greater the weight, the greater the use and thicker the line. Um, uh, so this for, for this normal period, we can see a strong presence of electromobility, innovation, the word digital related to Fundación País Digital in pink, right, after, right to the left. Uh, and also we can see 5G, entrepreneurship, mining uh, that are also present. We can also see a pretty diverse and active ecosystem um, in which País Digital, the Fundación País Digital is very important. Uh, this second um, visualization, uh, in this second visualization, we can see a shift on, a shift on the topics of frequency. Uh, electromobility also disappeared. Uh, innovation uh, decreases a lot. Cameras and security, together with Carabineros policy, the, poli the Chilean police, big data and government grow in frequency. Uh, so we can see the national political contingency very strongly here. But the activity by individuals is very high. Uh, we can see the small lines of purple color uh, that indicates the act this activity, this individual activity in Twitter, but no much relationship or thicker relationships between, uh, in, uh, between topics, uh, strategies, and technologies. Uh, and last one is, um, is the relationship between users and frequency of use of the terms with the topic strategies and technologies for the COVID-19 period. Comparing to the first visualization of the normal times, we can see much less activity uh, with 5G taking an important presence, innovation recovery and recovering, and still carabineros, the police, security, camera, showing that the political contingency is still very strong. Um, so finally, some final thoughts um, that I would like to share with you uh, from this uh, analysis that is very, is, is very recent. I, I last, well, the, I, I got the results, the final results last Sunday. Uh, so this is very new. Um, one of the things that I want to share with you is, um, can we speak of implications in new forms of urban planning when in reality smart cities and electromobility are not designed for planning, but for from from and for economic development? That's that's one of the things that I am I'm, I'm, I'm asking myself. Preliminary, preliminary results show that the smart city concept does not represent a new urban policy, but rather a narrative composed of a set of private public strategies, strategies in that order, for the development of technological industries in the city. The model circulates through closed circuits with a broad participation of private companies, some international agencies, and certain public institutions, among which the municipalities appear as passive clients. Uh, although it is declared that the inhabitant is the center, citizens have no participation in the activities and in the circulation of the concept. On the other hand, a deep social inequity, inequality is observed in the model's proposals, since the inhabitants and the territories considered are those who can access the technological products and services offered by this smart city industry. Quality of life is only possible for those who can pay. We can perceive new forms of urban planning not being done by traditional urban institutions, but by others like Corfo, aimed at promoting production and and economic development. It is interesting to see, for example, how, as a result of the social outbreak, the actions that linked the city with the technological solutions, which are the basis of the smart city Corfo model, drastically decrease. Um, so, uh, well, we can also we can also see uh, say some things about electromobility. Uh, which appears detached from a sustainable urban mobility approach, revealing very little presence of uh, urban and environmental authorities in the activities and discussions about the current strategy, being conducted mainly by authorities related to energy, mining and transport. 
from policy documents, seminars, press and social media contents, one might conclude that electromobility in Chile is not an urban policy, nor a transport, nor an urban policy, urban mobility policy, but rather an economic development policy or even more a strategy for the development of a Chilean energy industry and other business related to electric vehicles and its components functions. The city does not appear in the strategy, but as a scenario in which electromobility occurs and functions, always instrumental to productive development or to the development of industries. In this sense, the results lead to the question of the pertinence of using the urban policy mobilities approach. Since the smart city concept moves more as a slogan in a process of variegated neoliberalization in the city, than as a conceptual framework of public policy that allows real accountability and good governance. The common good doesn't appear as a logic of action, but as a possible positive externality of products and services related to smart cities. And finally, I, 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 I um, question myself about um, the potential political failure that implies adopting the smart city concept as an approach to urban policy and the urgency to reconceptualize urban planning with the new narratives that push new socio-ecological care and social justice terms. Uh, so thank you very much. Um, I st stopped using... Um, I don't know if um, you can hear me. Yes. Thank you very much, Constanza, for this very interesting and presentation with a lot of big data. It's really, really, I can just imagine your effort to bringing it to us from Sunday, from from having just from Sunday to prepare. But now I'll pass the floor to Juliette Marin from Universidad de Chile. And her presentation is entitled Under Urban Resilience Models, New or Straightened Hegemonies Hidden by Sustainable Discourse Rules. Um, so Juliette, the floor is yours. Well, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Camila, and thanks uh, to the organizer for all the work and the opportunity to present this, um, which is part of my ongoing PhD research. Um, I will start sharing. Okay, please let me know because I cannot see anything from now uh, if everything is okay. So I changed a little bit the title of the presentation to uh, Under Urban Resilience Models, New or Strengthened Hegemonies, uh, The Case of 100 Resilient Cities and Santiago of Chile. Uh, so this presentation is thus focused on global models of resilience, in particular considering the transnational and local networks where they are developed and implemented, in which they circulate and through which they perform, in order to understand how these models are acting and possibly transforming territories. So I would like to start uh, by situating resilience global narratives uh, as closely related with the perception of a world in crisis, a crisis that can be uh, ecological, economical, uh, or even since last year associated with the COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, resilient has been consolidated as a major global narrative since early uh, 21st century in a context framed within a global narrative that emphasizes risk and insecurity in all dimensions of life. Uh, in an hyper-connected world with unprecedented uncertainty and risk. In this, uh, in this risk, uh, global risk uh, per wo world, uh, resilience becomes a social mandate for individuals, organizations, cities, territories. Uh, it has an 
it has had a great discursive deploy deployment since the, the 2000s at the global, national, and local levels, and in diverse public policy agendas. For instance, it can be related with the smart city agenda that um, Constanza has just been, um, been talking about and, and presenting some very interesting results. It can also be linked with the climate change adaptation agenda, the disaster management agenda, regional economical development agenda, and national security and defense, uh, among others. It has also um, been a, a, a buzz concept in academia, um, where it has mainly been developed theoretically and methodologically by academic and private research centers from the global north. Um, we, there are a lot of, uh, there is a lot of literature, scientific literature on territorial resilience. It is quite extensive, multidisciplinary, applied to a wide range of system. That it can be a transportation system or urban system. Um, and it also covers a diversity of concern. But there is a consensus that the gen of the general need for greater territorial resilience and for the need of adaptation and transformation in a world in crisis. And resilience appears to be like the the, the, the solution. Um, the it, it is interesting to to note that um, the concept of resilience has been uh, quite developed since the 2000 uh, and since the 2010 decade. There has been a lot of work on. Um, conceptual framework and metrics, methodologies uh, that have been developed and also applied uh, over the last 10 years, uh, including the City Resilience Index developed by the 100 Resilience City Network that we will be talking more in a bit. Uh, there is also an important critical literature on re of resilience uh, that points out uh, resilience as neoliberal governmentality, um, mainly because uh, it points out that first, resilience is not ideologically neutral and serves the interest of dominant sectors. Resilience is a conservative concept that hinders real change. And third, that it facilitates the transfer of risk uh, management responsibility from traditional sectors like the state agencies to private companies, individuals or households. It has also been linked with different territorial uh, or social spatial processes, um, which effect appears to contradict those allegedly solved by resilience models, um, such as risk management, privatization, or remilitarization, urban security privatization, climate change adaptation, commodification, and misadaptation process with the increase uh, of social spatial inequalities. But it is less prominent in the literature, the question of, of resilience in relation to the tools and models uh, that, are, that have been developed and that are being used for uh, the design or at least the legitimization of actions and intervention uh, in the name of resilience and particularly focused on uh, global South territories and Latin American territories. Um, so now I will focus more on the 100 Resilience, um, 100 Resilience Cities program, uh, which was launched in 2013 by the Rockefeller Foundation. Uh, it was a philanthropic program that offered to distribute $100 million among 100 cities in order to promote urban resilience, seeking to act at the intersection of globalization, urban planning, and climate change. So the mechanism, uh, the main mechanism declared by the program um, were to enhance, um, uh, were to build networks and partnerships uh, of cities and public-private uh, partnerships in order to promote solutions and services for urban resilience. Each city uh, had to uh, candidate uh, to be selected in the program um, and, and then was allocated a funding of one million uh, US dollar for a two, uh, two year period funding um, that was specifically used to support the recruitment of, of only one person, a, pro a professional uh, named the chief resilience officer. This is a new ca category professional uh, category in charge of the resilience project in each city. 
furthermore, in during this two years uh, funding period, cities received uh, a lot of support, technical guidance, coordination, trainings, the invitation to global conference uh, by Rockefeller Foundation, but also by other uh, partner, um, private company partners, uh, particularly the global consultant company Arup. Um, well, being part of the 100 Resilient Network means to participate in this peer exchanging uh, activities with other member cities and in multiple events for peer learning uh, that were promoted. Well, uh, be behind the, sorry, the, the the important uh, framework used in this global network was the city resilience framework with this indicator, city resilience index that you can see in uh, here in the in the picture, and that was developed uh, at the early 2000 by the transnational company Arup, that was later the main uh, company, consultant company that was in charge to uh, to the guidance of every city um, of each city. Um, in order to develop the main product of the project that were the, uh, the city resilience strategy. So in the case of Santiago, the, it, it was not the city of Santiago that uh, applied, but the metropolitan area uh, and the uh, regional government. Uh, the conceptual framework used and methodolo methodological tools uh, were those developed by Arup, since the methodology is a semi-standardized methodology that is used all around the world to construct this main product that we can see here. It's a book named Santiago Humano y Resiliente, which is a, um, re the resilience uh, strategy of the city that was... Um, that was developed during the two-year uh, funding period uh, between 2016 and 2018, and that was later in 2018 um, voted by the local uh, authorities of the region as a public policy uh, tool for uh, operation to, to operationalize uh, the the regional development plan. So this uh, main product of the project later became a public policy tool um, that is still, um, how to say, it's still uh, um, in use today. Um, the actors that were involved, the, we have well, uh, local actors such as uh, universities, um, different uh, universities, uh, private companies, local private companies, uh, also global uh, private companies, global universities, since our conceptual framework and methodological framework was developed uh, using uh, the um, uh, using a lot of scientific work, mainly done by a global uh, scientific network uh, called Resilience Alliance, uh, that is also linked with the Stockholm Resilience Center. Uh, in the, the Stockholm Resilience Center, we also have the participation of, well, different public services, regional services of ministries, uh, private companies such as uh, public, uh, uh, the Met Metro in Santiago, NGOs and professional corporations. Um, it is also interesting to note that the, the, the resilience strategy um, was based in six pillars that were established as the most important one for the resilience of the city, of the region, and that includes very different agendas such as urban mobility, environment and sustainability, delinquency, innovation and business, or the access to public services and disaster risk. So this is, well, just another figure to, 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 sh to try to categorize different actors and how they, uh, how they uh, interact in the Santiago Resilient Project, but also the different result of the project. Because the main declared result of the project is supposed to be this resilient strategy I was explaining to you that later became a operative plan uh, for public fundings in the region, but we had also a lot of uh, other results that were not necessarily the main one, but still were created, such as uh, professional and social networks, 
public-private companies that were funded, and this indicator that was used, applied in Santiago, and uh, that served to, uh, to construct the, the resilient uh, strategy. So the first um, insight that I would like to, to share with you um, are, um, I would like to interrogate for social techno technical territorial processes. First, resilience model biases and underlying be belief systems that are not always explicitated. Um, well, the first one is related with the definition itself of resilience as a capacity to survive, adapt and grow. And um, this is, of course, quite linked with the, with the idea of uh, economic growth and uh, of uh, a mandate of uh, economical development. Uh, it is also interesting to see that it's urban focus, and this was contested, uh, questioned. In, it was a point of conflict in the urban um, use of this, uh, of this methodology, since local authorities uh, regional authorities co uh, contested this uh, focus on the urban um, on the urban systems. Um, we also can wonder what are the territorial effects of the model and its implementation, such as permanent changes in local administration. In the case of Santiago, a unit in, within the regional government was created, as uh, a public policy tool was created. Um, and also, the, um, it, it served to uh, as an argument for public-private partnership. Um, and one of the, the, the I, when, I, when I think it's quite important to to um, to revise to to, to see uh, in deep uh, is the case of Santiago Maipa Water Fund that was launched in 2019. Uh, with the argument, uh, the main argument of being part of the resilience strategy uh, of Santiago. We also have uh, the configuration of expertise networks with the, the figures of the uh, chief resilience officer that became quite important globally uh, and that provide new urban services such as um, they can uh, sell the, um, the service of, um, of um, guide cities to uh, apply to the network, to 100 resilient network, or to uh, develop their own resilience strategy with a group methodology. Finally, I think uh, it's interesting here in this case to look at the university's agents and what are their functions. Uh, they are in a unique position to connect the global and local um, actors. Uh, in this case, for instance, the, the project was formulated by a group of students in Harvard, uh, and it involved with it was involved with a local authority that was also a Harvard al alumni. So they have this possibility to, to, to move at both uh, level. They also had a key role during the implementation of the project as data and information providers, and of course, the role of legitimacy of the project. Well, just to conclude, uh, this is, of course, an ongoing work, uh, part of my PhD uh, thesis in which I'm, well, I have a lot of <laughs> open question and maybe we can uh, discuss a bit more about that. Uh, one of the, the, the points that I'm wondering is that even though the 100 Resilient City is supposed to be uh, finished as a project and a program of the Rockefeller Foundation, it had different legacy uh, globally and locally. And I wonder how this network are working in particular in the COVID-19 context, because we I'm analyzing it and there is a really important deployment of this network uh, with the pandemic uh, discourse of urban crisis. Um, so how to study this network that are actually right now very active and dynamic and changing. Uh, for instance, the Global Resilience City Network, which is the main legacy network, has already changed twice its composition and name in the past uh, year. So it's quite active, but also quite dynamic. And um, another, um, another point that I, I wanted to mention is that this is part of a research that uh, includes three cases that are quite different. We have this one of the global uh, 100 resilience city network, but there are also two other cases in Chilean Patagonia and in 
uh, in Colombia, in Manizales, that um, are quite different um, and will show different type of conflicts and translation uh, in the use of these uh, global models and narrative. I will stop here in order to in order to uh, uh, to comply with the time schedule. Thank you very much, Juliette. So now the the moment that we are all anxious about. <laughs> time to listen to our discussions. So I think the first will be Dr. Guillermo Hahamovic. So Guillermo, I'd like to thank you again and to invite you to discuss with us. Thank you very much, Camila. I have some comments on your paper. I think that after that, Gabriel might continue with comments on your paper and then I come again uh, with comments on Constanza's paper. Uh, to, be, to be short, I think that your paper, Camila, is really interesting. It shows us a complex history, juxtaposing different stakeholders, scales and interests. Uh, it problematizes the role of international agents in policy mobility literature, but it also resituates the, the role of local stakeholders in this kind of uh, experiences. Uh, I think that there are like some issues to be continued in order to uh, publish this uh, paper in a journal. I think that uh, to mention all these some things, the, maybe the literature revision could be like broader considering not just a uh, policy mobility uh, policy mobility literature but also like uh, planning history papers on slab on slam upgrading also latin american literature i was thinking about why not quoting fernanda sanchez for example uh, and also i think that there is a, an issue in the paper that deserves uh, more literature and it's related between uh, it's related on the relations between Latin American experiences, World Bank or international relations, and the use of those developments. Uh, I think that uh, it could be connected with discussions on urban development geopolitics and the role of Latin American experiences in those networks. I was thinking about uh, Sergio Montero's work, but also Jacob, Jacob Lederman. I don't know if you, if you know him. They are paying attention to the role of international agencies mediating in South-South circuits. Uh, I think that could be really useful. Also, like taking into account uh, Lederman work, I think that we might think about the global urban paradigm, paradigm, sorry, paradigms as a category. I think that there is like a, a risk to reify uh, something that might be more fluid. I think that in that vein, and this is also perhaps useful for Constanza. Uh, Lederman used a concept called world-class urbanism. In that, in that vein, I think that uh, we can also pay attention to uh, other things like policies, uh, things not so uh, more diffuse than policies. In that vein, uh, maybe as, as a question, perhaps, to publish the, the paper, the methodological section would be a bit, uh, a bit uh, more developed. I think that uh, also this is really small. I think that the movement from removal to improvement of slums is also part of a broader Latin American and transnational issue, not just a Brazilian, maybe that could be like uh, incorporated. And I, 
I was really interested in how you uh, you take into account you took into account the role of individuals, uh, but I think that that might deserve a bit more of attention. You don't you do not mention names of those individuals that are taking part in these processes, and I think that taking into account individuals and also its career paths would also be a, a good point to mix a micro and macro perspectives. I think that would be like really interesting. Also, a, a really small issue is related to a, an important point of your paper that is taking into account the role of national scales and stakeholders. I think that it is not just a, the slam policies uh, being diffused by the national scale, but I think you should also like mention, perhaps quoting uh, Porto, that there is a broader interest in Brazilian politicians and experts involving uh, other experiences. So I think that your history is part of other policies being uh, diffused by the local, but also by the national government. Uh, one more comment. I think that there is a, a really interesting tension in the paper. Quoting you, you say that the assemblage of slum upgrading technocracy was not top-down top dri driven, but negotiated between local and global actors. I think that a, a question useful in that direction is how this negotiated process dialogue with the aforementioned continuity of the geopolitics of expertise. In other words, how do you deal with that tension between a negotiated process, but also the, continu the continuities of the geopolitics of expertise? Uh, I think that I, I, I can stop here with the comments, also to hear Gabriel about, and then I can continue with uh, Constanza's paper. Right, okay, well, so let me start first by uh, thanking uh, the organizers, Camila and Miwa, and, and the presenters as well. Thanks a lot for the invitation. Um, so, right, so as uh, Guillermo said, we kind of divided the task because some of the papers came at different times. So the comments I'll be doing now are more related to both uh, Camilla uh, and, and Juliet, but I believe that might, there might be something there as well that is also relevant for, for Constanza. Right, so uh, what, I've had, what I have prepared here are, you know, a uh, a few comments and then a few questions. I'll try to be brief, and there were lots already of interesting questions that Guillermo posed, so I, I'll try to not to overload you too much, but please feel free to just <laughs> ask me to, to shut up. Right, so, well, first of all, so thanks for the presenters. So these were all, you know, very interesting uh, papers, and I could see there is a quite common uh, running thread through all the presentations, even though you're looking at different places, different policies, the institutions, the policy makers who are involved, they change. Uh, I think there are some common aspects which I find uh, very useful for us to have this conversation. It's always helpful when you're kind of having uh, a common, a shared thinking or, or perhaps a shared concern in how we are approaching a specific problem and how we are branching out different literature. So uh, for the purpose of this panel, I think this is this is really good. Uh, so, yeah, so, so some of the common points that I identified, for instance, and this is this relates to, uh, to the two papers I mentioned, could also be the case for Constanza. So, uh, first, I could see how they all share um, this concern in providing a critical analysis of how you know, global policy models are articulated. And especially, and this is uh, what I've also enjoyed as well, how such models are informed by specific values, assumptions, and ideologies that form them, right? So every single, uh, well, every model, in a sense, uh, they represent a particular worldview, right? But this is not to say that 
this is a, a there there is a consensus around an agenda i think these elements of uh things changing over time of uh perhaps even though i, I don't use much you know the idea of assemblage but you know that these things are not over determinated right so uh this in in a way it's always in contestation uh but it's interesting how even well even though these policies uh come in this case it, it's more uh from uh, a longer time frame the other two are more recent we can see they are constantly changed uh some institutions change as well i think this is one also note uh, that uh that i'll make uh but this is something that we could capture through all the different presentations right my second point is also i really appreciate as well the work done on an institutional level and how this was done at different scales as well so for instance this includes both let's say the more globalized institutions and how they are entangled so i find it uh, really interesting in camilla's paper not only to find the shared connections between uh let's say dominant actors such as world bank cities alliance but in the paper you also mentioned several others who form part of this let's say a uh, complex of urban uh, expertise that operates at a global level and how they are you know very uh entangled and uh, i find it's you know very helpful for us to to uh, to relate this to the local scale but this uh this was very much appreciated uh well in, in the case of judith as well the many consultancies the the different funders as well uh but well also what i also found uh very interesting how these also relates to institutional arrangements at different uh levels nationally regionally uh and locally as well so in order to to implement such policies uh, new institutional spaces they had to be created or they have to be rearranged in order uh, for that policy not to be to be designed and to be implemented so uh so this opens up interesting questions about well the idea of we, we have to open up this black box of the government the government but who exactly sometimes there are specific secret uh, secretaries uh within such uh, government structures sometimes there are particular individuals and this is one uh point that uh Guillermo brought that I found helpful as well because uh sometimes there are uh groups or individuals who are uh, very important to disseminate a particular idea to have something that catch on I think Julia persons highlighted the important role of universities and I also want to know more about the connections between universities and governments uh, in Santiago's case and how influential uh, or not I think you you brought interesting parallels between the leader who was elected and uh universities we've shared uh traject academic trajectories in, in in Harvard so I think this is helpful for us to overcome notions of uh you know institutional uh institutions as monoliths such as the government but even the world bank which is also you know a huge uh institution with different groups as well sometimes they 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 even have quite opposite views of things and uh, as a final comment as well uh i also appreciate how uh all the presentations were quite rich in terms of the case studies that uh they engaged with uh and how this is also beneficial for us to overcome you know this this sense that you know there are policies uh that in a, in a way uh, are circulating and then you 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 did not follow a process of just looking you know how these policies come and then are implemented and change and there is an impact or and that there is an urban or policy change but you also looked at how this reverberates in different directions in Camilo's case how you know the experience of Sao Paulo who was you know running much longer than uh any advice coming uh from uh especially you know, cities alliance which you engaged more in the in the in the 90s and in the 2000s they come together but also how this experience uh shape uh the idea of a of a model of the migrating uh to be taken elsewhere as well so i think as you said at the beginning of your presentation is not uh, as if the local is always determined by uh by the global so is this idea of reverberations not only going through other cases how experience in one particular place is taken forward to another case those who are involved in the design of these policies also take this knowledge to say other place i think this was also very interesting 
Right. Uh, okay. So let me move to to a few questions. Uh, I think that they are common. Three questions um, to all papers. So my first question relates to the demand side of such policies in, in Sao Paulo and, and Santiago. So I wanted to, to perhaps know a little bit more what exactly, it, in your opinion, what uh, uh, what in store for those people on the demand side who were implementing those policies at the local level. So in which ways the, engage, the engagement that such policies afforded them was beneficial to them? Right, so uh, I'm interested, for instance, we hear a lot about institutional capacity, access to knowledge, technology, just to use you know, so some, some dominant uh, grammars, but also critiques that they sometimes they are used to support existing agendas. So I just want you to know a little bit more, in your opinion, what exactly do you think uh, were the motivations and in which ways uh, those policies were benefiting uh, particular groups? So my second question is more about a, a reflection about what exactly was institutionalized. So for instance, if the infrastructures through which policy knowledge circulates, they are constantly changed. Um, Juliet mentioned, for instance, uh, sometimes we have an institution who is quite central at some point, and later they might not be so central. So the Rockefeller Center was quite, uh, played an important role to kickstart you know, this idea of resilient cities. And this is picked up by all the institutions as well. But uh, what, what I'm more interested is to look at the structures at the government level that received such policies. So sometimes you have a new structure that is created to elaborate. This was the case with resilient cities with this idea of the chief uh, resilience officer. So you have you know, government changes. Sometimes there are, are cuts in funding. But what, in, in your opinion, uh, managed to be institutionalized either in policies or in, in policy discourse. In a way, what really catched on, right? So what exactly is stayed? And then you, we, you could see that even if you know, some actors have changed, even some institutions, some ideas might have stayed. So I'll just need to, to look more of what exactly has sedimented there. Right, and finally, uh, my final comments are about uh, perhaps looking elsewhere, other networks, and what uh, perhaps I, I like to call uh, alternative networks of knowledge. So, in a sense, all presentations uh, looked at some dominant secrets, right, relating to multinational organizations, international consultancy groups, multinational companies. And I was just wondering, this, this is more a bit of speculation, really, if you, if you also found all the networks providing perhaps alternative narratives, uh, perhaps resisting, perhaps subverting uh, some of the policies you're looking at in order to change the policy agenda. So I promise that I, it, it was going to be brief. It wasn't, so apologies for that. I'll hand back to, to Guillermo. Thanks, Gabriel. Just a few comments on Constanza paper. I think that uh, the introduction of big data in this uh, discussion is really interesting, but at the same time, although I know it's a work in progress, uh, we might like discuss some things. For example, like uh, which is the exactly contribution of, of the paper in which debates uh, it engage, with, uh, which is the contribution to ongoing discussions on uh, smart city circulation in order to be clear about the contribution. Apart from that, and similar to my previous comments, I was asking myself, what is exactly circulating in the case of a Constanza paper? Is it a policy, an urban or and non-urban policy, but is it a policy circulating or is it something more diffuse? In that vein, I think I will mention again the uh, world-class urbanism uh, concept developed by Jacob Lederman. Also, uh, Constanza brings the discussion about uh, if urban policy mobility works well for this case, Perhaps, I'm not sure, but assemblage perspective might, might work better in your case. But also going back to the question on what is movement, what, sorry, what is moving, 
I would also like bring again Lederman and ask uh, in that direction, is it policies that are moving or we can talk about aspirations, images, strategies, discourses, something like broader than just policies. Uh, also, uh, as I talked before, uh, I would ask Constanza, and I know it's a work in progress, uh, what does the Chilean case add to current debates on smart city circulation? Also, I think that the paper deserves a, a broader uh, literary review and the specific contribution it, in that vein, it has like a lot of information. It can uh, be quite descriptive. I think that it needs uh, like a balance between the, the information and the literature, uh, literature review in order to like focus on specific contribution. Uh, in that vein, I also ask Constanza if the methodological novelty that you bring with your paper, it's a contribution per se or not. Uh, in that vein, also thinking about the material you brought today, uh, considering like Twitter or, and also like index or things like that, I think that Although you don't work with policy mobility literature or you discuss the pertinence of using that literature, I think that there is an issue that you, call, you, you can also like uh, use in more intense way and it's re related to the role of non-humans in processes of circulation. Uh, and I think that I stay there, but I think that it's really interesting to have like new perspectives new source of uh, information the the attempt to combine like big data with small data and also and i think that uh, it was like more present in the paper than in the presentation you are like really you, you really have like a good reflection on the strengths but also the limits of big data in this kind of information, in this kind of uh, research. I think that uh, that could be like a point to strength in order to avoid like uh, doing fetishism on big data. I think that you, you were really clear on that on the paper and perhaps you can reflect uh, more widely on that. And I stop there. Okay, Niwa, I don't know if they're there, or maybe we can start with the dialogue with the presentation. Well, while we wait, Niwa, I think that uh, I would also like to stress the question of career relating to the role of uh, the demand side. I think that uh, in, in Camila's paper, it's quite clear, but I think it, it's also necessary in order to avoid like uh, giving excessive power to the global actors or just what is moving um, who is moving that i think that more attention can be uh, developed on who is demanding and how is using that that it is being demanded hi uh, guillermo how are you fine hello osmani 
uh, sorry for uh, this. We, ha we had a, a small technical issue and we're just uh, correcting it now. So apologies uh, for not uh, changing uh, the, uh, you in the, in the screen. Uh, so now we are, we are moving back to, Gide uh, to Gabriel, is that correct? I think that the author, Eddie, uh, that Camila, Constance, or Juliet should uh, like continue the perfect. discussion. Okay, perfect. So uh, can I can I uh, move? So uh, can I start with uh, Camila, then move to Juliet, and then go to Constanza? Is it is this okay? I think it's okay. The order was Camila, Constanza, and Juliet, but it's okay. Perfect. perfect. Okay, perfect. So. Uh, once again, I'll take benefit of uh, being here and congratulate uh, all, all of you for this uh, very insightful uh, panel, uh, especially Camila for organizing this. It's, uh, it's definitely a huge contribution for the conference and I hope you, you're enjoying your discussion. So um, I'm moving now the, the, the word to Camila. Okay. So thank I you very be. much, Asmani. Good to see you here. <laughs> and also many thanks to Guillermo and Gabriel for the very um, provocative comments and uh, also very challenging questions. And uh, um, I also would like to 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 acknowledge that uh, something that I didn't say in my in the beginning of my presentation, so I'd like to acknowledge the the funding that I am receiving from Urban Studies Foundation. I have I'm a postdoctoral fellow of the foundation, so and this has been an incredible opportunity of. Uh, pushing further some of my research as well as uh, development of uh, new, new research. Uh, okay, so, well, thank you very much, Guillermo, for your comments. I, I really would like uh, to publish at some point this research, and you gave me a very good feedback, feedback of how to do it. Uh, I perfectly agree with the extension of the literature review. Um, I'm not aware of uh, planning history papers on Islam upgrading, um, I, I'll check it again. Um, I, I, I'm not aware of planning history um, papers on the circulation of uh, Islam upgrading ideas. In fact, even in urban studies, it's not very common. Um, the paper that I like, like it most uh, comes from an author from the international relations field. And, uh, but one very interesting um, comment and observation was into the incorporation of, of the advantages of incorporating the Latin American literature. And, uh, and, and I guess this is very interesting because it also adds another scale to this uh, movement of ideas, actors, and policies. So I'll talk about the, the local and um, the national and the global scale, but also we can talk about the regional scale. Of course, they, they, all the scales intersect and sometimes overlaps, but uh, it would be very interesting to bring uh, Latin America debate more into um, this paper. And uh, uh, also about the, the role of individuals, more attention to their names, career paths. I try not to mention the names in terms of, uh, I don't know, protecting a little bit their personal identity, but I try to describe their career path. Maybe I should um, describe a little bit, bit more into details, their career path, the institutions, uh, um, where they have been circulating. I try to do 
uh, I, I, I describe it the, the point where they were at the local government and some positions that they took in the international networks or as consultants for international agencies. I think it's very interesting how uh, these individuals, they, they are at the same time enacting as consultants in the international scale and as politicians, political actors in the local scale. And uh, so maybe I should put more emphasis into it. And um, what else? And then you, the very challenging and interesting comments is how to, to go further with this tension between a process that is negotiated, the creation of this technocracy as a process that is negotiated, and this as a continuity of geopolitical issues. So I think that um, it, it's, it's, it was very uh, need to have more reflection on the, how this is a negotiated process. So I put more emphasis on it. But uh, of course, the paper would be enhanced of also recognizing that the power asymmetries are not um, dismantled by this negotiation process. Um, so, and uh, Moving forward uh, to to the questions bring by Gabriel and uh, uh, and talking a little talking a little bit more on the demand side of the Islam grading and I think it's very interesting and I try to to highlight a little bit more in the paper than the presentation this how in the local government if you look to the for for the long trajectory and for a longer period of history of islamic grading development uh, in the local uh, government you see that um, many times the international support has uh, been demanded to in order to support uh, locally uh, up uh, a political project. So I mean, and uh, in São Paulo, from the 80s to up to the moment, you have uh, simplifying two general views of Islam upgrading. One that is much more um, relying on the empowerment of social movements of uh, uh, the the of the the engagement of social of engaging social movements in the local politics and uh, giving them more space um, including of managing the resources and another vision that is um, it's, it's not very much relied in, in, in a dialogue with social movements movements it, it is participatory but it's more like a, like a how can I say an invited participation? You so uh, the communities are invited to 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 comment uh, the project they, that they that it's been offering to them and uh, to accept or not negotiate it, but they are not um, they are not really decising about it, you know, and um, and. This is part of local of a local political struggles between two groups of uh, I would say two um, Epstein communities that exist in the city and the international support sometimes uh, very often is demanded in order to locally legitimate one or another discourse and. Um, uh, so uh, this question about uh, what exactly was institutionalized 
uh, maybe um, it's more for Constanza or Juliet, I think, because in my case, uh, is, Islam upgrading is a, it's a, I, I am discussing it as a policy model, as it circulates, as there is a general framework uh, entail uh, a set of instruments to implement it, a shared conceptualization of it. That's why I mentioned it is a global policy paradigm. But um, I will I will give a second thought on the comments made by Guillermo that maybe this is a very uh, uh, fixed framework for something that is more fluid. But um, Islam Brigade have been developed for such a long time, not only in Brazil and Latin America and, and other uh, countries from the south, so you have a very uh, well institutionalized structures to deal with it, not only in Brazil, but in other countries as well. As well. well, maybe in South Africa they are struggling a little bit more to to institutionalize, to strengthen these structures, but um, it definitely in the Brazilian case is very well structured, and this is why since the eighth. Um, Islam upgrading have some kind of uh, inertia, um, uh, even when there, there there aren't much resources, or even when um, the the political uh, group that is at the administration at the moment is not very um, how can I say is very not very. Um, advocacy is, is not have a, a, good, a very good advocacy for Islam grading. There is something that uh, is, is a policy that has never really stopped since the eight. Sometimes it's weakened, but not stopped uh, for a long period. And I think this is um, this is due to the to the institutionalization of structures in uh, at the government level. And uh, well, if, and finally, to look at the uh, alternatives networks of of knowledge, it's, it's uh, in this paper I focused much more in the um, in the in bringing uh, the public of uh, the vi the vision, the perspectives of the public officials, um, individuals that work for the local government, and how they see Islam upgrading and how. They demand the international support, and how the international organizations also build on their expertise to adapt it, to enhance it, to improve their model that will be circulating. And, but of course, there are alternative uh, ideas in Brazil. The social movements are really is strong, and they have their they own view on it that is much more um, rights based than. The, based on productivity issues um, as the sometimes the World Bank um, view um, uh, the, the word the vision the view transmitted by the World Bank. Um, so I would place the floor for my colleagues for Constanza and, uh, and Juliet. So I don't know if it's my turn. Uh, um, thank you very much uh, to to um, to the commentators for the comments, for the observations, and for the uh, for the questions, because they are very important to uh, to uh, to. Um, uh, for me to continue the work that I'm just starting um, in terms of the, specifically in terms of big data and the relationship with small data or ethnographic analysis. Um, I'm, 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 um, I'm, a re I'm doing the reflections still after this. So, um, I would like to start with the comments and the observations about what's the real contribution of the paper. Um, well, the contribution of the paper is basically to understand, and this is something that is very important in Chile, and that's why I got the funds 
from this national fund, from the seat, the national fund to, to for research, to understand how smart city circulates and how how um, how is being uh, is being used by the institutions and who are who are the actors and what's what are the ideas and what's the role that smart city concept uh, or model has in urban planning and urban governance. So that's that's one of the contribution of the paper is to contribute to that knowledge, to that national knowledge, uh, and also to um, uh, in the in the in the way to to learn about smart cities. I found electromobility as the star dimension, uh, and I, as I said, and as a special case study. Uh, to also to study the circulation, not not just the not just of the model, the strategy of electromobility, but other other kinds of circulations uh, that are related to um, electric vehicles and its com their components. Uh, electric vehicles are considered uh, beneficial for the operation of the the vehicle in cities. But and there's no uh, discussion about the, the 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 fabrication of these vehicles and the recycling of the components uh, of these vehicles. And I'm talking about the lithium industry, and and I didn't have time in the presentation to to show that. But the lithium industry in Chile is is very important, and we have a, a whole mining economy uh, starting from that. Uh, and there is um, a lot of um, um, environmental damage uh, related to water used in the lithium industry in Salar de Atacama. Uh, so how the, the, the paper also contributes uh, on how this uh, electromobility case study, the uh, case study of the smart city, contributes to the circulation of other other territories, I would say, uh, the mobility turn, the mobility approach here is not just about the cities, uh, the urban, but also other territories that are connected to this uh, strategy uh, because it's not a public policy, electromobility, uh, uh, and also the the uh, the recycling of the components, may, meaning the batteries. Only five percent of the batteries are recycled worldwide. Uh, in the current time, so we don't know what's going to happen, and that that's uh, an important issue for not just for the cities, for but for for many territories, um, not just in Chile but worldwide. Um, so the circulation of smart city and the electromobility as a strategy and a star dimension show other types of uh, diffusions uh, of ideas of. Uh, a, objects uh, in cities and other territories that are very important to show and that are not being visualized uh, and, and are not being discussed um, and they are presented as utop utopias. Um, also the contribution of the paper is to inform um, how um, uh, what is supposed to to be a policy for the city but it's not. Uh, this is an economic activity in the city, in the city. Um, so a city is an instrument for this ac economic activity, a smart city industry of products and services. And that's why it's very important. And, and that's why um, I'm, I'm wondering if the urban planning, ur urban policy mobility approach is, 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 very, is pertinent to, to this uh, research. Uh, because it's more than you is more than you urban it's not urban it's economic uh, and it's not policy but it's like an economic activity there is no decision making process but but a trade fair of products and services so uh, that's why i am questioning the the approaches uh, and also uh, the contribution is also another question because uh, you know this open the, the paper open questions uh, um, and I'm, try I'm, I'm trying to answer them uh, um, uh, while I'm working on, on them um, in the, in the um, field work these days. And it's about the question uh, about uh, urban planning. What is urban planning? And uh, what are the possibilities of urban planning and the possibilities, the possibilities to perform it? Uh, and I wrote on the paper that at other times in history, 
Other urban imaginaries have already circulated, such as the case of Futurama uh, in New York City in the year 1939. Uh, there was, it, it was an international exhibi exhibition event sponsored by the General Motors and in which the icon of the future was the private cars, and the car and, and the infrastructures associated with its operation, in particular, in particularly the roads. Uh, so in this case, the imaginary link to smart city would follow a similar logic. Uh, the city is a product created as a machine to invent moder modernity, to expand, to extend it and to reproduce it. So the smart city would be part of the marketing of this new technological market, um, an engine of economic development, etc. Uh, so the question is, um, uh, well, what's the role of the city and what's, what's the role of urban planning in a context of profound changes produced by the so-called four industrial revolution, uh, uh, the gig economy and platform economies, as well as the emergence of the data as the new capital are some examples. So again, urban planning, what it is, is uh, it's the question is still open uh, um, because so also because institutions like uh, Ministry of Urbanism are basically absent in the circulation of the smart city uh, uh, concept. Uh, municipalities, Ministry of Urbanism, uh, their institution doing urban planning, but they're not here present in, this, in these discussions and in, the, in, in these um, uh, trade fairs. Uh, also, uh, a question about the contribution of big data. Uh, this, this was an experimentation of, of my research. I uh, immersed myself in the big data analysis because um, because I was in the smart city world, uh, meaning that uh, in the smart city world, data is very important, it's very strong. Um, so and, and social sciences in a way have been uh, questioned uh, in the on the predictability and capacity uh, the pre predictability capacity uh, they have to the predict the future, etc. So, with all these platforms, uh, the digital platforms that we are using, the interoperability platforms for the um, urban management and etc., there, the, this this digital transformation is uh, uh, pushing us to us to to understand this world of this digital world, and big data has a lot to do with it. Uh, it, it has a very strong uh, role in this and there are some uh, in in, um, in chile and in, in latin america there are some people that are using big data to perform digital uh, to to perform social sciences uh, to perform research on social sciences and the uh, the, the uh, possibilities and the limitations are pretty clear but the exercise my exercise was to immerse myself to understand how this beta the big data analysis work and to be informed, to be really inform um, the the uh, when when uh, when data scientists and engineers talk about it, to be informed about it. And the thing is, the robot is very stupid. The robot uh, needed my knowledge, my previous knowledge, to be supervised and to be trained to perform this big data analysis. So the learnings that I got uh, are very important to to be very informed about the limitations and, and the possibilities and also because big data contributed to this analysis because uh, right now i have these visualizations and i have this networks analysis to show hey this is not ethnography only these are the big data we have uh, uh, thousands of thousands of twitter activity that show it so in a way it's a power thing to 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 put this conversation in the more engineering uh world uh I, i'm running out of time so if we have more questions i can title them afterwards thank you um Yes, I will try to be brief. Thank you so much for the questions and the comments. Um, yeah, actually, I was wondering about the, um, 
one of Gabriel's comments about how uh, the three presentation were trying to look at the um, how these models are uh, re reverberating in different directions. And I think that's quite interesting in the case of uh, the 100 resilient cities because uh, where, when I'm, so I'm right now doing my field work and I'm doing interviews and I'm, I don't know, uh, following a lot, I'm observing a lot of online events and online communication. And it's not really clear what is the stage of the, of the network. It's supposed to be over. There's supposed to be other networks, but it's very confusing. And it's also confusing for the actors in the network. So I think this is quite interesting how there are like this declared effect, these um, wanted effects, these declared effects, and these invisibilized effects, but that they are actually currently performing um, and performing. Um, aside of the official uh, discourses. Um, well, to answer the, the question about the, the local motivations, the motivation of local actors to participate, um, in, in, the, in the case of Santiago Resiliente, well, I think there was a very important uh, motivation for uh, the, the local uh, governor, so the regional governor. Uh, and as the, the resilient strategy became uh, kind of a political campaign, uh, or a political campaign document. And this is quite interesting because yesterday I was just walking on the street here in Santiago and there was um, a big screen and we are currently in a stage of campaign for uh, election for uh, regional governors. And uh, this local figure that was uh, the, the political leader of the resilient strategy uh, in 2016 and 2018 is currently a candidate. And the slogan he was using were the pillars of the resilient strategy. So Santiago Secure, Santiago, uh, Safe Santiago, Sustainable Santiago. And the proposal are those who, who uh, are inside the resilient strategy. So that gives, I think, an important motivation. But also there is a motivation for local government, act, um, government um, officers um, as it gives to cities an important, I don't know, reputation to be part of this network and also for the professionals because they are uh, the selected uh, person who are part of this very selective network where we only have like 100 person in the world. I think it's more uh, it's more or less 100 because in some cities they had like two uh, uh, city resilience officers. For universities, uh, I think well, I was myself also part of the project uh, as a university counterpart, and I think for universities, well, the motivations are there are a lot of motivations. Well, the need of funding uh, here in Chile, uh, the funding for uh, for instance. Uh, for research and applied research are not always that easy. So that was, uh, I think, one, one part of the motivation, but also to have like this reputation of public participation, to being uh, engaged in this policy, public policy um, discussion and to being contributing to uh, public knowledge. But this was quite limited in something that maybe I didn't say that well in the presentation, but that is in the paper, that is that the methodology used, that way, that's why I'm putting an emphasis on the model, because the methodology used for this project is already semi-standardized. So we cannot open the black box of the methodology. So the scientific participation was from the starting point already quite limited. And the role was more like to give information, to be the information provider, than to question the, the, the use or the definition of resilience or the topics or the pillars or the way to participate or who participates. Actually, that's not uh, the, the possibilities that have the, the universities. Um, but I think maybe I, I should look deeper in this, uh, in trying to understand all the motivations of, uh, of the actors. Um, concerning the institutionalization of, uh, in this case, resilience, uh, urban resilience, well, the, the, this case is also quite interesting in, in, 
in this uh, regarding this question because there was actually an institutionalization that was uh, permanent and that goes beyond the the project. So when the project ends, we have uh, a department, a city resilience department that is still functioning in the in the in the regional government that had professionals inside it and that is supposed to uh, implement the resilience strategy and to promote it. So it is definitely institutionalized. This depends on the cities and, and or re, uh, metropolitan area, but in the case of Santiago, it was. Um, but it's also institutionalized in other governance forms. And that's why I, I was mentioning the, the water fund. I, I think it's, uh, I'm currently analyzing it more deeply because this is a, a public-private fund that was um, argumenting through the resilience strategy um, document and arguments and all, but that has its own public-private governance and with a directory that is half-half um, private and public. So it has been sponsorized. <laughs> it was promoted by the new city resilience department within the, the public regional government, but as a, a private public directory um, with, uh, I don't know, companies like uh, Anglo-American or Nestlé, so where we definitely have conflict of interest, but that is completely invisibilized, completely uh, invisibilized in the promotion of this, uh, of this fund and I think it's going to be interesting to see other forms of institutionalization that go beyond the, the public uh, government. And uh, finally, about the alternative network of knowledge, uh, I think it's a very interesting question. In the case of Santiago, using the concept of resilience, I haven't seen alternative uh, network of knowledge. But in the other cases, um, I'm going to study like Patagonia and Colombia, there are other uh, how to say models that are in conflict and being negotiated, such as nature, uh, the environmental conservation or the disaster risk uh, reduction um, frameworks. So we we had like this uh, kind of other um, other networks that are being um, in tension with this uh, with this uh, resilience model. I try to be very concise because I know it's time, but I don't know if we're going with more questions or... Okay, thank you very much, Juliet. Well, we had a very interesting discussion and we, we are running out of time. We, we are supposed to be up to two hours and we just have three minutes. I would have questions uh, for, for you too, for us to, to engage in this common aspects uh, between our, our work. But I think we, we will have to stop now. So I would like to thank again all the presenters, the discussants. Um, I don't know if we are, ha we are having the, an audience because we didn't have any comments, but I guess the, the videos will be available and uh, well, hopefully. Um, other can reach our research and uh, we can engage in further discussions. And uh, once again, I'd like to thank a lot for Osmani and Miwa for this opportunity, for all their efforts um, that enabled us to be here. And finally, I would like to invite you to take a look on the handbook that uh, Osmani organized. And it just uh, it's just published by Edgar Elgar and uh, the Handbook of Policy Transfer, Diffusion and Circulation. And um, 
I have a chapter with, uh, I have the, the honor to have a chapter there with uh, Gabriel Silvestre and Guillermo Hahamovic on the circulations of planning ideas and urban policy mobilities in Latin America. So with this invitation, I would uh, left you and thank you all once again. And hopefully um, uh, we can uh, continue our discussions and reflections on the politics of uh, urban policy transfer mobilities and circulations. Thank you.